Okay, so now we're getting ready to introduce the God Deeds Mindset. Before I do that audio, or, or post it rather, I need to explain what's the idea that God has in mind that really we haven't covered in Christendom. And in fact, I didn't know about it either until my pastor started talking about it, and even he didn't know about it. Um, I want to say until like 1985, or maybe 1981. In 1981, his whole ministry just, you know, turned around, completely different from what it had been before. And in 1985, he was so disgusted with what he thought was true prior to 1985, he wanted to throw away all of his older teaching. And fortunately, the church convinced him, no, don't do that. It's a background for how you got to where you got. This is how we can follow you, okay? So you can still get the older stuff, but basically in 1985, he completely revamped everything he's ever taught. This is one reason why, and I hate to keep bringing it up, but I have to. Edward PF123 is a liar. He claims he was studying under my pastor. And he spends a lot of videos attacking both my pastor and me. My pastor's dead now. So it's really kind of petty for Edward to do this. He's attacking a dead man. And really, it's up to God to tell you if a pastor's bad or not. But the fact of the matter is, Edward was never under that guy. Okay? Because what he says about what my pastor says proves that he was never in class. First of all, he does know Greek and Hebrew. And second, he doesn't know what was taught in the classes. What he's going by are the books, which were actually edited by somebody else, sort of taming down and revamping and rewording what the pastor actually said. Okay, now it's not like those books d don't have any value or validity because the pastor, you know, um, accepted them. But if you went to the actual classes that the guy taught for all those years, um, you would realize that the books really don't cut it. They don't explain what was taught in the classes. And of course, the classes are heavy. They were about oh, 70 to 90 minutes each, six times a week. Well, actually, seven times a week, twice on Sunday. You got Saturday off. Okay? So it's really heavy stuff, filled with exegesis. You would have learned 20, 30 new Hebrew and Greek words every single week. You could learn how to read and write in Greek within 18 months because of the kind of the way he does his teaching. He's always going through the, the language. You know, he takes a verse, and then he picks it apart using the original language to tell you what it really says and how you can prove the interpretation. It's very collegial what he does, all right? Now, why am I going to this long introduction, which is typical for me? Because I can't find anybody but him or the 700 or so pastors who were schooled under him who actually know about what's really the spiritual life. The spiritual life is what God does to you. It is not what you do yourself. Okay, but if it's what God does to you, then it's going to happen in you and how the heck do you tell the difference? Because it's still coming out of your body. It's still coming into your head. It's still coming out of your head. It's still coming out of your mouth. How do you know if it's coming from God or it's coming from you? And that's the big challenge of the spiritual life. It's really, really hard. This is the same spiritual life that, that Jesus Christ had. That is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is that when Christ came here, he crafted an entirely new spiritual life out of the Mosaic Law and beyond the Mosaic Law. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. Because the Mosaic Law wasn't, it couldn't save you. It was a post-salvation covenant to start with. And it was really designed to prepare you for learning your future Messiah. It was a post-salvation covenant. It, was, it, it couldn't save you. And that, of course, the book of Hebrews goes through all that. All right? So he had to craft 
from its limited provisions and teaching a whole new thinking style. You know, because the Mosaic Law was, was, you know, a lot of outer practice. You did the outer practice to get the inner learning. Okay, but now everything is reversed. You do the inner learning to get the outer practice. And I spent about five years writing up the differences between the two covenants, old and new, in my Lord versus Satan series. If you want, you know, to go plow through all that and it's really heavy, just let me know and I'll send you a link. Okay, but the point is that the, the whole spiritual life is now based on the spiritual life that Christ lived. Growing up spiritually, the whole mechanism is completely, uh, you know, obsolete to the Old Testament. That's what the book of Hebrews is, is about. That's, it's explaining the changeover. That's the whole theme of the book. Okay, First John is also on that topic, as is um, Colossians and Ephesians. And, uh, yeah, First John ties back to Ephesians. Ephesians is um, the basis for the book of Hebrews. So it's Ephesians, Hebrews, 1 John. Read it, read it in that order. Okay, because they're all talking about the changeover. Why was there a changeover? And the pastors out, out there don't recognize that's the purpose of these books. Except the only ones I can find that recognize that are the ones that were taught under my pastor. Now, why why did he get it? I don't know. Is he the only one, you know, him and the group that, that studied under him? Are they the only ones on the planet who got it? I doubt that, but I can't find anybody else. So that's why I had to have that long lead-in about my pastor. I just can't find anybody else. If you can find somebody else who's figured this out, put it in the comments so people can find that pastor. Okay? Okay, so that's a seven-minute long introduction to getting to the point. God deeds. You are the fruit, not what you do. That's Isaiah 53.10 contract. We are a body. We, all of us, if you believe in Christ, you're subject to this. And it's really hairy what the new story is. You are an award, a possession. Booty is what the Bible term uses. Called shalal in Hebrews. Uh, in, in Hebrew, Isaiah fifty three twelve, you are booty for Christ. You are His prisoner. You are His slave. You are His child. You are His asset. You are an award to Christ for beating Satan. That's Hebrews two. That's what you are. That's what I am. Everybody who's ever believed in Christ is booty, but church is built on Christ, which he invented as a post-mortem contract in order to continue time in Matthew 16, 18. And he prayed for that contract, the body, to be completed per Father's discretion in John 17, verses 20 and following. Because Israel had made everybody run out of time because she rejected Christ. And honey, had we been there, had we been Israel at the time, we'd have done the same thing. So don't go blaming the Jews. Okay? The fact is that those people at that time were supposed to accept him and time hung in the balance as a result. They didn't accept him. So he invented a new body of people. And the calling out of the highways and byways Matthew 22 is going on now it's like it's like a sort of reverse Esther you know the book of Esther where the where Vashti wouldn't come so the the you know the emperor guy what was his name um, Xerxes you know gets all nervous not nervous but upset and says okay we'll just run around Susa and everywhere else and find me a harem and I'll pick one to be my queen and that's how Esther came in to be and that's how Israel got saved okay well this is how Israel gets saved again only it's through a goy Esther which is a composite of a number of believers who believe in Christ after Pentecost and before the rapture Okay, and that will restore time to the Jews. That's what causes the tribulation to be kicked off. That's why it can only be pre-tribulation. That seven years and then the last 1,050 1, years will play. It's called 1,000, but there's a 50-year tag-on period that I've covered in my 
um, GGS videos. The point I'm trying to explain is that you are part of a body, a royal bride being crafted. Now, not everybody in the harem is ruling alongside the king. Not everybody in a royal family rules. They have the birth, they have the upbringing, they have the status, but to be royal versus being ruling are two different things. That has always been true. I don't know how anybody can be confused about it. Everybody who's born again, everybody who believes in Christ, between Pentecost and Rapture, is body of Christ, is bride of Christ. Okay, but the bride is a harem. The bride is royal family. That's First Peter 2, 5 and 9. Not everybody in a royal family rules. Ruling is a job. Royalty is a birth. So if you don't learn your royal upbringing, which is the whole reason why you don't immediately go to heaven after you believe in Christ, you now have a royal job to learn. If you learn it, you will become a ruler in eternity. If you don't rule it yet, learn it, yeah, you'll still be royal family. But you will not be a ruler. You'll be under a ruler. In other words, some other Christian is going to be your boss forever. Not Christ. Not directly. There's going to be a hierarchy. A sort of federation of kingdoms in church. Headed by a few. Paul, we know, got the crown. That's uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. But there are X number of kings being developed down here. Every single one of us... At the second birth forward, God's will is for you to be one of those kings. It's his will for you. It's his will for me. It's his will for anybody and everybody who's ever believed in Christ. So you and I and every other Christian on the planet, ever since Pentecost, has a royal training program to go through. And every single thing that happens in your life is part of that program. Period. Doesn't matter what what Christian denomination you are. Doesn't matter how correct you are in your understanding of the Bible. It doesn't matter how correct your teacher is. None of that matters. This is the will of God for every single human being who's a believer in Christ. Period. Now, what it ends up being, it's kind of like a marathon race. And that's the actual verb that's used in Hebrews 12 or Hebrews 12 and somewhere else in Corinthians. The Greek verb is trepho. Okay? And it means a marathon race. Well, you know what happens in a marathon race. It's so long. Everybody starts out and you've got hundreds and hundreds of people starting out. But only a few finish, get to the finish line. And that's the way it works here. Is basically... You've got your whole life to learn this training program. Okay, and your your manual of training is the Bible. You're supposed to be under a teacher. God has a whole, uh, and everything. When you brush your teeth, there's a will of God on that topic. So the question is for you to get with this program. Who's your right teacher? What should you be doing now? Whatever Bible he's got that teacher teaching you, that's what you should be learning now. Whether you like it, you understand it, or not. And whether you like it or understand it or not, God is using you 24-7. The trick is, the question is, are you going to receive benefit for the way he's using you? And the answer is no if you're not using 1 John 1 9. No if you're not under your right pastor. No if you're not learning and living a Bible. The whole key of it. Use 1 John 1 9, get under your right pastor, learn and live on Bible, and really we can add a fourth thing. Be on the be on the horn with God constantly. Be online with God, aka prayer. Prayer is a conversation first and petition second. Do those four things. That's God's system. It's called Genotes in the Greek, and that's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 4. When he says unity, it's mistranslated unity. It means a unified system of learning, of being in harmony with God, not with people. Notice what doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter how you're viewed by society. It doesn't matter if you're paraplegic. It doesn't matter if you have an IQ cold to, a room temperature on a cold Chicago day. It doesn't matter if you're wrong about doctrine. It doesn't matter if you're right about doctrine. You could be the most apostate sect on the planet, like the King James Only movement. God still has a plan for your life, and he's still going to use you. But how much are you going to benefit from that? How much is that going to make you spiritually grow so that you inherit a kingdom? And before you say, oh, I don't want that. I don't need anything from God. Honey, you don't honor Christ unless you go after it. You're spitting in his face if you don't go after it. Because he's the king of kings. He went after it. So, honey, if it's right for him to become a king, it's right for you to be one too. And you're spitting in his face. You're spitting on your inheritance in Christ if you don't go after this. You're like the stingy servant in the talents parable. Remember that? There were three servants all together. One of them got five talents, which is like five years' wages to play with. Another one of them got, I, I think, another five or two. And then a third guy got one. And the third guy who got the one said, Oh, my master is, is stingy and nasty. Of course, the guy who's, the good, who's saying that is the one who's stingy. I'm going to just bury this talent in a napkin in the ground. Because I don't want to lose it because then I'll lose my head. See? Yeah, that's you if you don't learn the spiritual life. Use 1 John 1 9 like breathing. Find your right teacher. Learn and live on Bible under that teacher. And talk to God all the time. About everything. And then you'll grow into kingship. That's the God deed in your life. That's what he wants. He wants it for you. He wants it for me. He wants it for everybody. But it's a marathon race. It's going to last your whole lifetime. And like Paul said at 2 Timothy, 2, 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, at the end of his life, oh, I got the crown. Yeah, you won't know. It's pass fail. You won't know until the end of your life. If you finish the course. Most Christians don't. 99.9% .9 of Christians will quit. They either never get started because they think that their life is supposed to be about good deeds. They never get started. Or they quit. So, that's why history has gone on so long. Why the rapture hasn't happened yet. Because everybody's quitting. We know for sure one guy got crowned every 490 years or we'd all be dead now. Because somebody's got to be crowned every 490 years. At least one person has done that. Okay, there have been four. There were in the fourth one now. We're coming up on the end of the fourth, 490 years since the cross. So, did somebody get crowned already for this 490? Or not? If by the time this 490 ends, nobody knew is crowned, then history ends. Rapture or no. Okay, the rapture just means that it might happen due to a second cause. But that rule about the 490 has been true since Adam. Okay, it predates Israel. The, the rule for Israel was slightly different. It was aggregate. But the rule for church is still the same as the rule for Adam. Somebody during a 490 year period has got to super mature. If you super mature, you are crowned as a king. And you will have other Christians who are your subjects that you actually own forever. Now, how many kings do there have to be before the rapture can occur? Well, that depends on the population size of heaven, which I'm estimating is somewhere around 100 billion people. See, the job, the good deed that you're being trained for is not down here. It's post-mortem. You're being trained to be a king so that you will have the an unending good deed of being a king over millions maybe. I don't know how many. Millions maybe. Billions of Christians. Probably millions. Forever. You're being trained down here for a job that is born after you die. So the God deed is for a God eternity. That's primary. That's your primary purpose for being here. God is training you for something that he wants you to get ready for now. 
that you will have this job after you die. And most Christians won't. They won't undergo the training because it's lifelong and it's really hard. Because like Paul says, you have to bring every thought into captivity. 2 Corinthians 10.5 That's a lot harder than doing a good deed, honey. So that's the God deed that he's training you for. And every single thing in your life is geared for that. In order to be a king, you have to learn to have every thought brought into captivity to Christ. Well, that can't happen until you know Christ. And you can't know Christ until you know scripture in your sleep. And I don't mean just be able to recite it. You have to understand how all the passages interrelate. You have to understand all the doctrines. You have to go through a very long phase of of learning the Greek and the Hebrew. Because you cannot understand what the doctrines are until you do that. Now, ideally, your pastor will teach it all to you as he goes along. He'll teach a verse, he'll give it to you in the English or your native language, and then he'll show you the original Greek and Hebrew at the same time. And line on line, precept on precept, that's how it goes. And it takes years to get a coordinated understanding of Bible. It takes years to get fluent in Bible thinking. It takes years to get what Paul calls the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. But you know what it doesn't you know what doesn't matter? It doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter how smart you are either. I'm smart. Oh whoopee, that and twenty five cents will buy me what? I've been told I was a genius since I was a kid. And you know what? That buys me nothing. I know nothing apart from God. Everything I got, I got from Him. Including these smart genes, but the genes do no good. A stupid person can make more money than I do. A stupid person can be happier than me. My smarts count for nothing. So don't ever evaluate somebody who's smart as being better than you. You want to get smart? You think that's valuable? Fine. Use 1 John 1 9. Learn and live on Bible under your pastor. And you'll be smarter than all the geniuses on this planet. Okay? So, it doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter what your background is. You don't have to have any money because a good pastor teaching Bible like this isn't going to charge you for it. And if you need money to study better, ask God. He'll give it to you. Every time I needed something for Bible study, I asked God for the money and I got it. You know, the Bible study stuff isn't cheap when you, you know, buy the software and stuff. The good stuff isn't cheap. Ask God for the money, He'll give it to you. I asked God to give me the money so I could give it to other people. I did that too. So what, He's going to say yes to me but no to you? Am I better than you? Hell no. Okay, so remember this. The God deed is to develop your head so that every thought is brought into captivity to Christ. And to get that, you have to get the Bible in your head. And only God can put it there, but he has a system. Use 1 John 1 9 or nothing's going to happen. Find your right teacher. God will know who it is. Ask him. He'll make sure you find out within a week or two. And... Number three, learn and live under the, on the Bible that your pastor's teaching it as he teaches it. And number four, talk with God 24-7 if you can, of course, you know, as often as possible. Then the God deed will be done in you. And as you do this, as you learn this, there is going to be a change in your mindset, in the way you think. And that's what the next audio will cover. Peace out.